good evening everybody and welcome to tonight's talk on the origins of the idea of genocide in the 20th century it's a privilege and honor to have with us here tonight professor caroline jadeen of yale university uh, this is professor dean's first visit to kolkata welcome to kolkata and although she was visiting for just a few days, when I proposed the idea of this talk, she readily agreed. So thank you so much. We're very grateful for doing this for us. Uh, Professor Caroline J. Dean is the Charles J. Steele Professor of History and French at Yale University since 2013. Before coming to Yale, she was John Hay Professor of International Studies at Brown University, where she taught from 1991 to 2013. She has also been the recipient of several distinguished fellowships, including an American Council of Learned Societies Fellowship and the Guggenheim Fellowship, among several others. In 1996, she was awarded Professor of the Year by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and the Council for Advancement of Support of Education. Professor Dean is a historian of modern Europe with a focus on the 20th century, whose work explores the intersection of ideas and culture, most recently in the context of genocide. She has also written extensively about gender and sexuality in France and on the intellectual history of French theory. She is currently working on a series of essays on recent narratives about human dignity and atrocity photography and a larger book scale project on the history of homophobia since the 19th century in Europe and the United States. We would hope that we will have her back in Kolkata sometime too soon to speak on these topics, particularly homophobia, a subject on which we in India need to work a lot. Professor Carolyn Dean has previously written five books that focus on the historical and cultural representation of victims including such recent ones, such as Aversion and Eraser, The Fate of the Victim After the Holocaust, which was published in 2010 by Cornell University Press, and The Fragility of Empathy After the Holocaust, also published by Cornell University Press in 2004. Her latest book, titled The Moral Witness, Trials and Testimony After Genocide, which is in the process of coming out from Cornell University Press. Uh, it's not yet available on Amazon and on the Cornell University Press for immediate sale. Uh, but this book is the first cultural history of the witness to genocide in the West. The book examines how the witness became a protagonist of 20th century moral culture by tracing the emergence of this figure, the witness, in courtroom battles from 1920s to the 1960s, covering the Armenian genocide, the Ukrainian pogroms, the Soviet gulag, and the trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem. In these trials, witness testimonies differentiated the crime of genocide from war crimes and began to form our understanding of modern political and cultural murder. Her talk tonight tells this fascinating story through two of these trials, Berlin in 1921 and Paris in 1927. And that's all I have to say for now. Like all of you, I'm looking forward eagerly to a fascinating lecture on a fascinating topic. So please join me in welcoming Professor Caroline Dean to speak on Witness Avengers, the Armenian genocides and Ukrainian pogroms Berlin 1921 and Paris 1927. Professor Dean. Excuse me, thank you for that. Before, before we begin, I have a pleasant <laughs> duty. Just a small civilian from the tribunal. It's very heavy. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no. Sorry. Thank you very much um, that for that. I didn't, was not asked to pre-approve the introduction or surely it would be, have been much shorter. Um, and I am going to speak today from the forthcoming book, though in a shortened version about the two trials that were mentioned. I want to thank 
Mr. Professor, I should say, Sen Gupta, uh, for, uh, for inviting me. And I um, want to thank all of you for the honor of coming out tonight to hear the talk, which I hope at least will be interesting. So it, I, what I've tried to do is to tell the narratives of these trials and then frame them with the question of the prehistory of genocide. Really, the question is, how did genocide come to mean what it did in the West? Is it okay with you? Is light okay with you? Uh, can I read or can it's okay. No, it's all right. I can see. Uh, let me just, I don't, is this correct? Let me just make sure, okay. I'm gonna just put it back to the title. Anyway, I'll just start the talk. All right. By telling the story of these two trials, I want to address a historical question. How is genocide given its cultural rather than legal meaning in the West? How were the ravages of genocide distinguished from the mass murder of imperial conquest and from war combat? This is a long story. It's worthy of a book, at least, uh, and many more, I'm sure. Suffice it to say that genocide, though a legal term, is slippery from a cultural perspective. It is used even now to prosecute perpetrators more likely to be able to talk about. Including in retrospect. When imperial nations, for example, finally acknowledge massive colonial crimes, they have often been called genocides. The story about how genocide was attributed with cultural meaning is thus also a story of how Western publics came to understand, acknowledge, and deny their own violence. And I'm going to speak now on the Telerian trial in Berlin. In the mid-morning of March 15, 1921, Sagam and Telerian shot Talat Pasha in an affluent neighborhood in Berlin. Is this very loud? Feels very loud. Oh, okay. Talat, one of the men responsible for planning the 1915 Armenian genocide, had been one of the highest ranking officials at the Ottoman court. Talat fled to Berlin after the defeat of the Ottoman Empire to avoid trial by the Allies, that is, the victorious Allies in the Great War of 1914 to 1918, the First World War. But he was targeted for assassination by the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, an important Armenian political party. The plotters in the party assigned the job to Telerian, whose family had perished in the genocide. The would-be assassin rented a room across the street from the former minister and got to know his routine. Tedirian shot Talat through the back of the head and ran, but he was cornered by bystanders who hailed the police as he protested in halting German that the incident was merely a dispute between foreigners and they should let him go. They didn't. The Armenian shooter was arrested and he was brought to trial a few weeks later on charges of premeditated murder. After a hasty preliminary investigation, the June trial lasted two days. This is actually in a museum in Istanbul. It is the bloody shirt of Talat. This is Talat's house, which is now a, it's just a building in Istanbul. This is not a very nice picture because I took it, but it's, um, it's a, I think it's a gas company or something, but it, it, it has a plaque. Devo dedicated to Talat as minister, former minister of the interior. Five years later in Paris, Samuel Sholem Schwarzbard, a Bessarabian Jewish watchmaker, committed a similar crime of vengeance. He had come to France in 1910 to escape political repression in Russia, fought in the Great War, won the Croix de Guerre in 1916, and acquired French nationality. He returned to Odessa in 1917 to fight with anarchist forces assisting the Bolsheviks to take over the city. Several years later, back in Paris, Schwarzbard learned that Shimon Petlura, former head of the short-lived Ukrainian National Republic, was living there in exile. And this stamp was issued in 2004. As you can see, like Talat, it has become, he is now a renew, renewed as a symbol of Ukrainian nationalism. <clears throat> 
Now, Petlura was living in Paris in exile, and he had been the commander of the Ukrainian army and had allegedly organized the 1917 pogroms that took some 50 to 60,000 Jewish lives and wounded or orphaned many more. He settled in Paris in 1924 as the head of the Ukrainian government in exile, and he published a Ukrainian language newspaper. On May 25, 1926, Schwarzbart shot him five times outside of a bistro in the Rue Racine and a few more times after he was dead. When the police showed up, Schwarzbart proclaimed that he had killed a great butcher, a great assassin. He was arrested and put on trial from eight days from October 18th to October 26, 1927, after a pretrial investigation that lasted 17 months. Both Tellerian and Schwarzbart were acquitted of murder after juries heard blood-curdling accounts of the Armenian massacres and the military invasions of Ukrainian villages. The verdicts decreed that the shooters had momentarily lost control of their free will, in both cases because the defense showcased the atrocities that had pushed each man to lose his composure rather than the murders they had committed. Polish Jewish lawyer Rafael Lemkin, who had coined the term, who later coined the term genocide in 1942, though it was only published in a book he wrote in 44, mentioned both trials in the same breath. He referred to the absence, as he put it, of, quote, any law for the unification of moral standards in relation to the, the destruction of national, racial, and religious groups. Lemkin, for those of you who don't know, uh, he, was, uh, he lost all his family in the Holocaust. He eventually died in the US uh, penniless and um, uh, at a very young age of heart failure but he had coined the term genocide. He was sidelined at Nuremberg and never really deserved the, he never got the recognition that he deserved during his lifetime. So he believed that Teverian had acted as the self-appointed legal officer for the conscience of mankind. He called Schwarzbart's crime beautiful. Now these are the first major trials in Western Europe featuring victims of inter-ethnic violence at state-sponsored mass atrocities seeking justice. Lawyers used the trials to bring the Armenian genocide and the Ukrainian pogroms into public view, even though it was the victims of these events who were on trial for murder. They took advantage of the media surrounding each trial, not only to call attention to the crimes, but also to highlight the absence of an international tribunal charged with bringing perpetrators to justice. Both trials took place at a particular moment, international imperialism, national self-determination, and claims about minority rights framed debates in the League of Nations about Armenian statehood. Jewish organizations pressured the League to protect Jews in the newly created nations of Eastern Europe. Now, both famously failed, both efforts. These two trials are also part of a broader phenomena during and after the First World War of 1914 to 18 of using testimonial practices to denounce atrocities committed against suffering others. Jews and Armenians, in fact, produced volumes of photographs and narratives documenting the violence to which they had been subjected for a wide variety of audiences, non-Armenians, such as the British historian Arnold Toynbee and the German missionary Johannes Lepsus, also wrote important works about the Armenian genocide that documented and denounced the crimes. I'll talk about that a little later. The trials depended on victim testimony, whose use was controversial. Atrocity, uh, excuse me, audience equated, audiences equated atrocity literature with state propaganda, whose pub and publics believed that victims' perspectives were overly subjected. If subjective. Toynbee and Lepsis had more credibility than eyewitnesses who were victims. Trials, however, provided a forum for publicizing atrocities um, in the defendant's words in court and to the press. I have mixed up something here. So Toynbee and Lepsis had thus had more credibility than eyewitnesses who were victims. And this is a quotation from Toynbee's very famous book published in 1916 in the middle of the war uh, called Armenian Atrocities, the Murder of a Nation. So the, um, 
and he, he wrote, and I'll just read it, when we read, when we read that the Assyrian or Babylonian government carried into captivity such and such a broken people or tribe, we hardly seize the meaning of the statement. Even when we see the process portrayed with grim realism on the conqueror's bas reliefs, it does not penetrate our imagination to the quick. But now we know. It has happened in our world, and the Assyrians' crime was not so fiendish as the Turks. Organized and effective massacre. That is what such a deportation means, and that must always have been its implication. So it is important to note that in the West, the Armenian genocide really is the first one not to be publicly recognized, but to be recognized by such by important intellectuals, but also by the Russian government, who coined the term "crimes against humanity" in a diplomatic broadside. That a broadside is not diplomatic by definition, but it was intended to be. It was a, it was a controversial document that did not make it into a into a treaty, but it was coined by the Russians to describe what happened to the Armenians. Um, so the great powers, so in, in speaking about why victims' testimonies weren't believed, it's important to realize that Toynbee and others were in fact uh, taking advantage purposefully and strategically of their role as prominent public intellectuals to speak on behalf of victims. Now, great powers also, for the reason for the skepticism of victims is also because great powers had issued white papers describing the atrocities of others, the British on German conduct in Namibia, the Germans on the British in Kenya, not to mention apocryphal stories about enemies' actions during the Great War. So there was lots of atrocity literature out there, much of it, as I said, apocryphal. And much of it not, but competing national discourses about whether the British uh, committed worse colonial crimes than the Germans. So the trials, however, provided a forum for publicizing atrocities in the defendant's words, in court and to the press. By putting the Armenian genocide and the Jewish pogroms on trial, the lawyers hoped to prove that their clients had acted without premeditation, gripped by forces beyond their control. The more harrowing the testimony about defendant's suffering, the more likely they were to gain jurors' sympathies. Lawyers used temporary insanity defenses to argue that their client should be acquitted, defenses that were nonetheless a stretch given how much time had elapsed since the defendants witnessed the violence. Moreover, there was other evidence of premeditation in both cases. In the course of the trials, lawyers ended up subtly differentiating forms of organized violence, not only from combat and imperial conquest, but also from cri crimes against civilization, about which it was the obligation of the dismayed Western spectator to express horror. Until the word genocide was, genocide was coined, these crimes were often referred to, and I'm sure you've heard these, or if not, they were referred to as horrors, vile acts of cowardice, unspeakable barbarism, and the like. In other words, this was a, a, a narrative of a so-called civilized spectator observing the violence elsewhere, elsewhere meaning the, the, the else other than the free democratic West. So I'm going to speak about the trial then of Telerian in detail now. Telerian's hasty 1921 trial lasted from June 2nd to June 3rd, 1921. During the preliminary investigative phase, he admitted he had killed Talat, but insisted that he had acted on his own. You'll recall that he was actually an operative in the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, which had orchestrated the assassination. Worried about being condemned to death for a political murder, he played the role of an anguished and isolated actor whose epileptic fits, which he really suffered from, were brought on by memories of his family's murder. The prosecution never brought out his involvement in any organized plot to pursue Talat, who was the first of several Turkish nationalists to be assassinated in a series of murders the ARF, or Armenian Revolutionary Federation, dubbed Operation Nemesis. There are many books about this operation. Correspondence between the German Foreign Office and one of Telerian's defense lawyers indicates that the Weimar government the German government in between the wars until Hitler took power in 1933, acted to limit and in one case prohibited the testimony of a diplomat at the trial in order not to expose the extent of German complicity. 
the complicity in and knowledge of the Armenian genocide. The Germans had acted essentially as a counterinsurgency force in Anatolia, where the genocide took place. Some, of, some killings took place in Istanbul as well of Armenian intellectuals. The Germans had acted, uh, uh, sorry, the Foreign Office may have hoped for a conviction in order not to alienate its former Turkish allies, but it was also concerned that the German army not be implicated in crimes against the Armenians. These government measures did not prevent the trial from becoming a cause celebre, however, but shortened Teleryan's time in the public eye and turned testimony away from the German army's misdeeds to the defendant's distress over what he said he witnessed, the murder of his mother and his brothers and the kidnapping of one of his sisters. Medical experts couldn't agree on whether he was responsible for his act, but they all agreed with one exception, that his epilepsy compromised his free will. What never came out in the trial was that Teleryan did not witness the genocide, but was in Tiflis, now Tiflis in Georgia, when the Turks murdered his family because he had volunteered to fight with the Russian army, but which many Armenians did during the Great War, even though Germany and Russia were enemies. When he returned home, he found a brother alive and the town abandoned. At the trial, he insisted that he had witnessed the murders. The trial, with its famous defense attorneys, which who I'm not going to describe them all, became a media sensation. The judge's opening interrogation revealed his sympathy for the defendant, whom he probed gently about his experiences. Teleryan recounted his story calmly and deliberately, beginning with the Ottoman order to leave his village in 1915, the robbery of their convoy by troops who stole their valuables. They had only been allowed to bring what they could carry. And then bursts of gunfire, at the sound of which a soldier dragged his sister away and his mother screamed, he said, may I go blind. Teleryan said he could no longer bear to think about their suffering. I do not want to be reminded of that day. It is better for me to die than describe the events of that black day. The judge urged him to try and recount what happened as best he could 